They say that you can't put a square peg in a round hole because the peg couldn't possibly fit neatly. This expression has been aptly used to illustrate the futility of all sorts of things, from military and political alliances to personal and working relationships. As a matter of fact, you can get a square peg into a round hole, and I'm going to show you how it's being done right now, today, in this video. Think of this burgundy panel as representing the ideal, the nirvana, of evolutionary theory in science. It's completely solid. There are no unknowns. All questions have been answered, all blanks filled in, all the evidence points in the same direction, all competing theories have been reconciled and combined to form one perfect super theory that explains everything we see. Scientists are out of jobs, labs are closing, government grants are no more, and obviously further research would be totally redundant and therefore pointless. Well, in reality, as with most things in science, this illustration is more accurate. We have a solid understanding of many things, but there still remain unknowns which must be investigated, tested, researched, and incorporated into and reconciled with all the other theories that seek to explain the same observed phenomena. Much of what we know about most aspects of evolutionary theory has been confirmed so often that scientists take these ideas for granted, practically as proven facts, as solid and reliable as 1 plus 1 equal 2. But there remains a subset of unknowns that we continually chip away at. Or to put it another way, relative to the to the burgundy panel, our the diameter of the unknown circle is continuously shrinking. How did we get to this point in the first place? Decades and decades of free scientific inquiry, exhaustive experimentation, testing, and observation, all under the umbrella of the scientific method. Peer-reviewed research methods, empirical data, Multidisciplinary verification where appropriate, integrity in one's work, honesty in one's findings, conclusions, and criticisms of others, room for doubt at all times, openness to debate, well, at least reasonable debate at all times. Each of these principles and practices applies to this entire picture, but science can only begin to reduce the number of unknowns by establishing new things that are known, demonstrating their veracity, incorporating them into the existing models, searching for conflicts, and updating the theory if required. New data brought into an existing model may require the modification of that model, may merely reinforce a particular aspect of that model, or may have to be thrown away if their collection or analysis techniques are found to have been faulty. Creation science is the square peg in this round hole of unknowns. And this is how they're making it work. First, the claims of creationists derive from self-referential, unchangeable ancient texts. Their claims disallow room for doubt, requiring instead that faith be relied upon whenever a problem arises, and never ever permitting the use of the phrase, we don't know. They directly argue with millions of empirically observed, tested, and interrelated data points, either denying them completely or continually moving the goalposts in an effort to avoid acknowledging them at all. The human population is at six and a half billion. Trace that backwards, it all started 4,400 years ago, right when the Bible says the flood occurred. They have trapped themselves between two options. They can deny all or some of their ancient texts, or they can deny all or some of the scientific data points. It is through strategy two that we are currently witnessing in real time right now a square peg fitting in a round hole. They force themselves into the round hole of unknowns by increasing the public's perception of its diameter. This is accomplished with the jackhammer of pseudoscience, disinformation, dishonesty, denial, and cultivated ignorance. They concede that microevolution happens while denying macroevolution, while failing to understand that the only difference between the two is time. They deny a great deal of what genetics has shown by claiming that no new information is ever produced while hesitating to define what they mean by information in the first place. They're perfectly happy to trust some whack jobs carbon-dated Noah's Ark fabrication finding, yet claim that various forms of radiometric dating are totally unreliable and worthless for measuring the age of anything. <laughs> Look, Mr. Brady. These are the fossil remains of a marine prehistoric creature found in this very county and which lived here millions of years ago when these very mountain ranges were submerged in water. I know, the Bible gives a fine account of the flood, but your professor's a little mixed up on his dates. That rock is not more than 6,000 years old. 
They deny that any transitional fossils have ever been identified, insisting instead that only by being shown ludicrous impossibilities would they even consider evolution as having any merit. They claim that an eight kilometers deep worldwide flood is responsible for the state of the fossil record, the current distribution of continents, all of the sedimentation and stratigraphy we see, and even craters on the moon. They do this while conveniently forgetting the fact that you would have to increase the Earth's hydrosphere by a factor of about 3.3 in order to get an 8 kilometers deep worldwide flood. I did a video about it. They enjoy bringing up long-ago debunked scientific frauds and mistakes while never submitting their own quote-unquote research to any peer-reviewed journal that wouldn't get laughed out of a fifth-grade science fair. Mere days or hours after receiving a vaccination or having their children vaccinated against deadly dangerous illnesses, they put up a YouTube video claiming that exactly the science which developed those vaccines, using exactly the scientific method upon which they rely for their health and that of their children, is somehow completely flawed and should be taken out of the textbooks. I disagree with these experts. Somebody's got to stand up to experts. What possesses millions of rational, mostly educated people to do these things and to think this way? Do they even know their purpose, or are they truly sheep, parroting talking points and voting accordingly? The tax. I mean, he's raising the taxes like crazy, and we need freedom. We didn't vote for this health care that he planned. Well, and what, what are some of those things? What are... Well, I mean, I can't think of anything right off the bat. Tell me about the bills that are being proposed right now. <laughs> Not really. And uh, what are some of the lies and the spending that you have particular problems with? The bailout, um, whatever. I, I, uh. In my opinion, the primary purpose of their behavior is to maintain a minimum diameter of our whole of unknowns in the public perception. By denying as often as they can, never conceding that any premise of theirs has ever been disproven and debunked, even though most of them obviously have, they are in a desperate struggle against the tireless momentum of science and the inevitable accumulation of knowledge. Several times in the last hundred years or so, we've seen creationism or its tenets on trial both in public discourse and in the courtrooms. With certain exceptions, it has thoroughly lost every single time. Only by ensuring that there are enough ignorant people in the world can they be certain that their claims will endure and continue to influence public and social policies and legislation. This is because they understand that there are incredibly strong direct correlations between a population's average IQ and that same population's percentage of non-believers. There are also strong direct correlations showing that these societies have longer life expectancies, have higher average total education, have higher per capita income, and other practices and social conditions which most people seem to appreciate and which most people actively seek out. By ensuring that the whole of unknowns is large enough, while simultaneously ensuring that a substantial and vocal enough percentage of the public has the perception that what we do know is somewhere between fundamentally flawed and outrightly immoral, the creationists continue to be able to influence people here to do this. So that he can say this. To me, it's pretty simple. A person either believes that God created this process or believes that it was an accident and that it just happened all on its own. Or even this. But you know, if anybody wants to believe that they are the descendants of a primate, they are certainly welcome to do it. I don't know how far they will march that back. And not immediately get laughed out of the building. Fanaticism and ignorance is forever busy and needs feeding.